Today, we're chatting with a special guest expert about opening doors with your book, strategically positioning it for success, and keeping up with a constantly evolving publishing industry. You definitely don't want to miss this one, so don't you change that dial or drop that phone. We're about to level it up and shatter the mold. Question. In a world where groupthink is the norm, others want what you've earned, and thinking for yourself will get a target painted on your back, how do you flip the script and level up your business, your money, relationships, your health, your status, and your life? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan, and it's time to shatter the mold. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Shattered the Mold, Andrew S. Kaplan. Really excited to be here with you today. We've got an awesome guest on the way. But before we get there, as always, quick update on the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need to read. Continuing to do well on the charts on Amazon, a number one bestseller in multiple categories. And a huge thank you to everyone who continues to buy the book and leave those five-star rave reviews and email me letting me know how you're liking the content and more importantly, how you are using it in your life. I really appreciate it. I also appreciate you telling all your friends about the book and spreading the message and letting people know about it. So thank you so much for that. And if you've not checked out the book yet, you can feel free to go to lastlawofattractionbook.com. That'll auto forward to the Amazon listing where you can check it out in Kindle or paperback or audiobook if you prefer. And if you don't want to pull out your wallet, that's okay. You can always go to youtube.com slash Andrew Cap. That's where I have the free content devoted to the book. I teach brand new methods. I feature LOA experts. And I've got a few other surprises for you there also. With that said, let's dive straight on into our guest. And I'm not going to you her name right away. We're just going to call her M for now, but she's the author of three best-selling books, a two-time TEDx speaker, and a story strategist who helps speakers, coaches, healers, and other rebels write, publish, and profit from their game-changing books. Her students have published bestsellers themselves, they've spoken on many stages, including TEDx, and they've been featured in the Huffington Post, Forbes, Success, and many other publications. And as I was diving into this interview with her, I was teasing her about wearing a hat just like me, which you will see if you're watching this in video format. But with that said, let's dive straight into this interview and welcome her to Shatter the Mold. I put on this hat just for you, Andrew. I appreciate it. Your signature. (laughs) I decided you're representing German shepherds. What, 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 what's the little, what does it say there? It says bad boy on it. So this is, um, of course you are typical, right? (laughs) Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? Mine is my Toronto Maple Leaf representing the six T dot. And let's do a little reveal. What is your, what does your shirt say? Oh, my shirt says create the life you love. This is actually. Um, this is a shirt that I got as part of an entrepreneurial group called The Foundation about six years ago. I absolutely love that. Create Thank a life you love and that you got that with, you know, that you have a memory and a distinction and something that marks you with words. I absolutely can't even tell you how much I love that. That speaks to me as I drink from my what if cup. There you, uh, go. you know, I have a right on <laughs> uh, everything. My shirt, if you can read that, says well-behaved women seldom make history Mm, all right true right we're dropping knowledge there we go so you know it's actually that's kind of like a perfect lead-in because you know well (laughs) i was gonna say actually we got to interrupt the lead-in because we got to get your name straight first and then we got to like go to the lead-in so you know so Marav, Marav, I was like, there's so many different ways that people pronounce your name. And we were about to hit the record button. You're like, I've got an answer for you. So I'm like, all right, record. (laughs) What do we call you today? I love that you're asking me that because I've had my name mispronounced so many times that I don't even remember how to pronounce it. (laughs) And I always know where you're from by how you pronounce it. So I get all kinds of Mariev, Mayrev, Mirage. I, I absolutely love every single one of them. And a lot of my friends call me M. And so we are friends and your listeners are friends. And if we're really friendly, then you could call me Lady M. Mm. (laughs) I'm going to start with M and I'm going to try to sneak in a Lady M by the end to see if I've established it. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. It's kind of like as we're playing checkers, if I give you the crown, then you can call me Lady M. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to look for a signal here without without a signal. I don't know if I'm going to go that way, but we're going to start with M and we're going to do the lead in because you, you know, pertaining to your shirt and about history making, Yeah. you're right now, I mean, and you've been in your own way making history already, but you're ramping things up a notch right now as of late. 
And you'll correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm misdescribing it, but as I understand it, people now are going to your company if they want to successfully self-publish on Amazon. And they're through your company, they'll find the tools and the insight to do so. Is that a fair way of putting it? A hundred percent. So that's, you know, as we all know, the game has changed. Uh, the turbulence of the last few years has, has shifted the game. And so the same tools that applied and the same training, and the same uh, knowledge that people had access to five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, doesn't pertain to the to where we are now. There are things shifting uh, and there are big announcements made by some really big players that those of us who know what's coming, you know, in the waters coming up are going to know how to navigate it. Mm. The ones who don't know what's coming into the marketplace and, and, you know, what changes are being made are going to be left out going, oh gosh, I wish I fulfilled on that dream that I had for so many years of becoming an author, uh, fulfilling my, my dream, my destiny. And we know, I know, you know, I've read your book cover to cover, absolutely loved it. And you know how a book opens doors. It yes. begins with a book. People are, are saying like that that's an aging industry. It will never be in an aging industry if you keep up with the trends, if you keep up with the innovations, if you strategically position. Uh, and yeah, you, you write a book and you're, you know, looking at suddenly doors are opening where previously those were only windows mm. that you would look out and go, gosh, how did that person have that phenomenal success? And well, how did that person get that movie? And how did that person get that business going? And, you know, you're looking out this window going, gosh, it looks like everybody else has this phenomenal rise and trajectory. And, and they're like on a, on a rocket ship to success and to creative innovation and to doing all these cool things. And when you write a book, literally those doors open for you. Mm. It is so much more than just having a product. Right. It literally opens the doors. Now, you know, you were just speaking about, you know, their rules are changing, standards are changing, the way things yeah. are done are changing. And I, my book is a little over 200 pages, but I'm going to operate, for example, under the assumption that um, maybe one of the things that's changed is you don't have to have a three or 400 page book. If you really want, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, or if this doesn't align with, with um, what you know, you can even have a hundred page book. You can have all sorts of options. In other words, you're not limited by these old standards of what's expected because it's really the quality of the content and the way by which you leverage it in your business and your life. Is that a fair way to put it? I love that you're bringing that up because definitely there are rules, but there are different rules for different players. So much like in a game of chess, uh, you know, the pawn moves one way, the, the bishop moves one way, right? Each different player has a specific uh, strategy that would be attached. Mm -hmm. So even with my program, uh, I've identified that there are six author archetypes. Uh, and when you first come to work with me, we identify exactly what your author archetype is, what your goals are, who your author role models are. And so considering what kind of book, so if you're looking for a book to be an authority space, then you're 100% right. Not all authors are coming looking to become experts in their field or, or looking into becoming an authority in, in the niche. So it's really important to identify which chess piece are you, which author archetype are you? Uh, and, and I'll give you a really, really, really big value add, really big takeaway for the listeners here. In case you're sitting there going, gosh, I wonder which one I am. Just a tip of the iceberg. You usually are the kind of author of the kind of books and content that you like to consume. Mm, very insightful. So you usually write what you like to read. And like Stephen King said in his book on writing, which is actually, it's on writing, but it's actually a superbly interesting autobiography and just shows you how it's done by storytelling of his life. Uh, read, writers are readers. And then I add on, and readers are leaders. Mm. So whatever it is that you're reading, what it is that you're consuming, what it is that you enjoy, that's the kind of book that you are most apt to write most, most, uh, you know, that's your, that's your chess piece. Got it. 
That's so interesting. I've never heard it put that way before. Um, Cause when you think about it, it makes sense, you know, different archetypes, different styles, different areas of expertise, therefore different delivery of the information on different ways by which you do it. Now, you know, I hear you say that, I guess it sounds to me like part of this, you know, when people are working with you, it's in the identification of their archetype. When people are usually like they hear this, are they usually on board or is there ever a difficulty in discovery of their archetype or how they're gonna leverage it? Like how does that even come into play? I love, 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 love that you're asking that. And I love what you just said because you are an expert an authority archetype. So even when you're saying, when, you know, we don't need a long book and, and it's a 200 and this is, you know, to position yourself in your business, you can see how lit up you are based on the archetype that you are based on, you know, you're not going uh, against the stream of who you naturally are and who you gravitate as a reader. Mm. Uh, so most people, if they're told, if they were not an authority archetype, author, they would have heard that and gone, gosh, I, I mean, is there no space for creativity or storytelling or because that they would be against the generalized uh, knowledge wisdom that exists in the publishing world that it looks like this or it looks like this, they would go, that's not me. Is mm. there no space for me in the marketplace? And when you find the one that you are, you're lit up about it. You put wow. aside all the other archetypes you go nope that's not for me and that's great because you begin with the end in mind you know you know exactly there are strategies and ways of actually capturing your content if you're a creator archetype or a storyteller archetype or a writer archetype a publisher a promoter or an authority there are just different strategies you're going to approach it very differently yeah so what I love about your answer is what we're really talking about congruence here, meaning yeah. the stuff that you're lit up about, the stuff that you feel good about is what you're predisposed to. So when you allow yourself to kind of follow that thread, it's not an uphill battle. Your path to success becomes that much smoother, that much faster, that much easier, and that much more really in, with integrity of who you are as an author and as a business person and just as a human being. Yeah, exactly. And doesn't, I mean, isn't that everything about law of attraction? As you teach, you become, come into alignment with who you are and you don't have friction, mm. right? You don't have any friction coming in. You are literally attracting uh, your, your, let's call it copy, which, you know, someone who is not the writer archetype might hear that and go, oh, there she goes all businessy talk. Right. I don't like it. <laughs> but your copy, you know, your business copy starts to align with who you are. And so you start right away attracting the same kind of readers, like other than on writing by Stephen King, which I think is a brilliant book. I haven't been attracted to Stephen King writing since I was a teenager. You know, for some reason, as teenagers, we like to scare the crap out of ourselves. I don't know why. You know, I, I, all adrenaline I, junkies at that age, right? A hundred percent. I used to read it and then fall asleep. And then, you know, the book would fall and I'd be scared that there's a clown coming out from under my bed. It <laughs> terrorized me. And I told my kids that. And then my kids years later, when the movie came out, watched it and went, mom, you're a wimp. That wasn't even scary. I'm like, read the book. You, you know, <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you've overcome that because I mean, some people are listening on audio, but for those watching video, you've got a huge clown nose right in front of you on the microphone. You're like, I feel <laughs> fear nothing. <laughs> yeah, I did get over my fear of clowns. But well, you know why I have this red mic? Let, let's hear uh, why. I know you know, because I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I have this red mic because I have a signature of wearing red lipstick. And so I got this little red nose mic so that if I accidentally touched the top of the mic and put a little red lipstick on it, if it were another color like black, you might see the lipstick. And like mm. this, it's camouflaged. Fun, funny insider then, story for the audience here is like I kind of halfway promised that we'd get that in somehow some way and here we did we made it work <laughs> you know these are the little women's secrets that I don't know if um, men in this sort of podcasting thought leader you know uh, expert uh, archetype authority archetype you know they we don't hear those secrets so I have a like a lot of little secrets for women Mm -hmm. <laughs> that shift you know men don't have to think about that yeah well it all comes down to details right like you know and everyone spots and is worried about or is, is fueled by specific details depending on who they are so it makes perfect sense 
And, you know, even hearing you say that, I mean, obviously this is clear, I think probably why your company does what it does, because from my experience, at least when we're talking about like the Amazon piece, it's all about details. There's so much that has to go on under the hood that you want to be intelligent about so as to, you know, increase the likelihood of people, the right people finding the right book, you know, hopefully being your book, right? And I'm wondering, because here we were just talking about the archetypes, and here we're talking about how, like, your company will help people get there. Is there any, or are there any specific things that everyone, like, everyone always falls for a trap or has a misunderstanding of something where if they just really saw the way something was or the truth of something, it wouldn't be so complicated and would get much easier. Is there any illusions or or falsehoods out there that people operate under when they're trying to publish, where if you just told them, no, it's actually this way, it would clear out a lot of the cobwebs for them. I, 100%. I always tell people if they actually got how easy it is to actually achieve their dreams, uh, they would be propelling themselves in their, in their own sense of fulfillment and their own life forward. Uh, I think what happened was by design, you know, if we look back on it, gosh, I can go back into a history all the way, you know, from uh, the Gutenberg press and the Protestant Reformation. And, you know, we're um, like the written word. Uh, actually, let's go back even a few millennia, because here I am wearing a t-shirt that says, well-behaved women seldom make history. And I'm going to geek out a little bit here. Permission to geek out? Geek Listen, out. We're hey, hat buddies today. I said permission to call you M. So we're, we're, we're halfway there. Please. Oh, you might call me Lady M by the end of this geeking out session. There's a book that I read uh, quite a few years ago that really marked me on my path. It's by a man named Leonard Schlein. Um, now, that's just a fun name to say, but it, he is, and apropos of nothing, when I like an author, I geek out on them. So I actually uh, did the research uh, into his life and found out that he's actually, his daughter is married to Mel Brooks, which, I mean, come on, like, we're just, that's cool. Hmm. Uh, Leonard Schlein was a a neuroscientist. He, he was actually a brain surgeon. And, you know, as you can imagine, doing brain surgery is, is you know, you have to get into a zone, right? A very, a very uh, focused zone. And one day as he was operating on someone's brain and, and there, and he knows the biology and the, you know, structure of the brain very well. And he suddenly had this idea, you know, suddenly something fell into his brain. He, he captured one of those ideas from the, you know, form of ideas that exist above us. It came into him and he started having this uh, idea to, to really delve into this research. And his book was called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. Hmm. And what he looked at was, you know, he looked at a historical overview that looked at in pre- uh, pre-written societies, we had an oral tradition of sitting around a fireplace and telling stories. In those traditions, it was uh, egalitarian and actually had quite a lot of female deities. So they were, you know, they, they were not mono monotheistic. They were looking at a few different sort of supernatural, uh, whether it be mother goddess, uh, mother nature as a goddess, or, you know, uh, fortune, different things that they would look at as the feminine entity because women primarily kept the hearth and home. So they were ideally the storytellers. As the brain evolved, when we started recognizing letter structure, the parts of the brain that recognize linear formation started to get stronger. And also we as a community, as a society started to value those who had a better ability to decipher these letter formations, the linear progressions, mm. rather than the oral storytelling, we, we actually created an environment that honored left brain or, you know, linear or what would be called masculine. Now, of course, the powers that be understood that there's so much power in that. So they kept the written word away from the masses. So most people were still oral tradition. After the Gutenberg press was invented, uh, that equalized the playing field. More people were being now taught how to read. So the power didn't rest in the powers that be, the ones that held, you know, all the scrolls and the church and the state. It actually came, it equalized it. People were being taught at first uh, men of, of certain ranks. And eventually they started to teach women or girls to, to read. And it 
equalized it. Well, today we're going through a shift as big as that uh, 15th century shift from the powers that be having the uh, secret access to the knowledge of the written word and back into this oral storytelling right brain feminine tradition, meaning that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, all the traditional publishing models were held by the New York, the big five, and they had gatekeepers at the door and they kept people out and you had to have a lot of uh, clout or, I mean, it was harder to get an agent than it was to get traditionally published. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had their distribution networks that were kept in house. And it was really hard to break into that or to bridge into that. Not to say that there weren't some success stories, but you didn't see a diversity and there weren't a lot of unique voices. It was much like it was prior to the Gutenberg press yeah. kept within a certain echelon of society. Fit this mold, do it this way. Otherwise you don't get the keys. You don't get to play. Mm. And usually it was pay to play. Mm. Right. And we know, uh, gosh, let's pull down the, pull back the curtains. Most New York times bestsellers are there because they bought it. Uh, you know, most right all of the charts they it's it's a question of pay to play uh and now the market has changed and so we're seeing as big of a shift and especially there are shifts coming that we see on the horizon we know some big announcements some, from some big publicly uh, traded companies are coming in and we're going to see a huge shift and the power now comes back to the people and while the oral storytelling tradition, you know, we can consider that, well, audiobooks, podcasts like this one, video podcasts, uh, video, you know, live video, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook lives, like we're seeing back to an oral tradition, mm -hmm. though the content still has an archetype. In our, in our mind, we have a prototype of a book. When you consider content, chapter by chapter, beginning to end, you see it as a book. Right. Just like every single kid around the world. I had a friend who studied uh, handwriting analysis, and she said it's amazing. Everywhere around the world, you ask a kid to paint a picture of the house, draw a picture of a house. It's the square with a triangle roof and usually a chimney on top, even those regions that have no chimney. Mm -hmm. we have a picture in our mind yeah same thing with a book when we consider writing content we see it as a book right when we tell a story we see it as a book as we're writing we we see it as a movie but the structure of a movie we can't see the structure of a book we can our brains can understand that right so if you even as i hear you say this i mean so many thoughts come to mind but it sounds like this is about leveraging what our understanding of a book is while simultaneously breaking free of any of the constraints that in, that's included there. Sounds to me can, like- Can I have you repeat that? Because I actually, that is good branding right there. Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm recording this because I don't even remember the, the, the exact wording. So I'll, I'll butcher it a second time here. But, you know, it's, it's I said something along the lines, I think of like, you know, we're, we're leveraging the way we- see what books are meant to be but by we're simultaneously saying we're going to break some rules within those confines so it'll that. still be a book but by that same token we can redefine what a book it actually is therefore we're not held to the same standards or constraints that kept us out of this game to begin with therefore we can go on a platform whether it's amazon or anything else get our message out there leverage the the power and authenticity of that message and do whatever it's supposed to do whether it's changing a paradigm whether it's growing a business whether yep. it's shifting the way something's done in the world or anything else. A hundred percent. And the biggest thing, so this is in, in the, uh, so I've been for many, many years, I actually was a, uh, one of the first uh, contributors of a huge franchise of books. I can't mention its name because it was sold off to a private owner many mm. years ago. Um, but I learned how to, how a book as a publisher was created, how a franchise was created. And then over the years, I've been helping clients, I've been helping authors, uh, both as a ghostwriter originally, and then as a coach. Uh, and the biggest thing I tell people always is 
get your book out because your book is the easiest, fastest way to get your IP, your intellectual property out there. Mm. You don't know how to write a screenplay? Hey, guess what? Few people do. Uh, and and copyright a screenplay. I'm, few people do, but get your book out there, and there's your IP. Now, if you want to sell that to the to the production company to make as movie rights and have their screenplay screenwriters create a treatment for it, it's your IP. So your creative, your all your creativity is housed in your own intellectual property. It's copyrighted. Mm. So. Right always begin with a book always begin with a book right now you know you were talking about before like geeking out yeah and <laughs> i think often for people when they want to write a book even those that just want to leverage it for business i think there's at least on some level in the back of their mind that desire that their audience geeks out on their writing their desire that they make an impact in that way um when people come and they work with your company is there a process by which you engage in, in helping them articulate that message or they already bring in the completed product to you a hundred percent i love that you're asking this and and i'm glad that we have our hats on mm -hmm. and you as the quintessential authority archetype are already uh looking at the possibilities of you know as an authority archetype some people might not you know might not have the writing as their passion they are experts they're subject matter experts in their niche in their field uh, they have a wealth of information. And yes, definitely, uh, we have uh, systems to, to not only help them bring the story out, but in fact, to whether it be write it for them, have different approaches in order to get that story out, uh, and definitely different tiers of that. Mm. Uh, that being said, that is as an expert, and or authority archetype as you are, and probably most of your listeners and watchers, because they're you know, because they're following you will probably be of the same authority archetype. Though I will say there are a lot of different types of archetypes of authors that I work with, even fiction authors that are the greatest challenge, for instance, I mean, pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for a very creative type, for instance, a creator archetype is building the riverbanks to stay in one field and in one stream. They right. have content coming out of them for miles. They've got journals and workbooks and everything together. So actually systematizing for them. So each archetype has a little bit of a different, um, uh, you know, a different pro and a different con, a, a different gift and a different challenge. Mm. Right. Uh, writer archetypes, for instance, if you're a Malcolm Gladwell reader, uh, if you're a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell uh, or Seth Godin, or uh, any one of those uh, authors that write in uh, very uh, short form or shorter form, uh, research heavy uh, or, or zingers, you know, if, if your kind of writing ha is prone to be an ism, mm -hmm. you know, an Andrewism or prone to have to, for people to pick up and get nuggets out of it, then you're probably a writer archetype. Um, but then how do we put all those snippets together so that they're cohesive? Right, right. So, you know, every archetype has a very different uh, need. Yeah. When, when I say something insightful, it's not a truism, it's a Druism. That's my style. <laughs> ah, um, that needs to be a caption. There you go. <laughs> that should be on a, on a t-shirt or on a hat. That'll, that'll be my next t-shirt, right? Like awesome. create a, a Druism you love. So yeah. where, you know, you could probably tell it kind of like where I was going with that, that first question leading you down this path, because given that you do help people on all different levels, and also given that I assume that people will find their way to this episode who are aspiring to write in some way, shape or form. I'm curious for those people that due to their archetype or their personality or whatever it might be, have a certain difficulty in articulating their message as well as they want to, is there any advice or insight that you might share with, some, with someone like that that could help them get a little bit further along? Oh, fantastic question. Uh, and really that gets into the very, the very basis, like the, the actual um, beginning, you know, the appetizer of where I work with, with people and it's just getting them into the challenge of the habit of writing hmm. uh, because writing is as much of an art as it is a craft. Uh, and, you know, every artist can sit down once, uh, you know, once a year or once every two years, or 
I mean, if you have a month to take in some private island in Fiji or Bali and and bring out your brilliant book, um, then my hat goes off to you. Uh, I, I know, you know, one of my greatest role models, Maya Angelou, uh, used to take herself to a hotel room with a bottle of whiskey and put on the do not disturb sign and, and pound out her books that way. I, my hat goes off to anyone who has that ability to retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it me treat. I go on a me treat once in a while. Uh, and I do get a lot of writing done that way. Uh, and that's not enough. Uh, it's creating a habit in your day to day life does require getting your butt in a chair. Uh, and we've all heard and I hope we've heard of the Pomodoro method, mm. right named after the you know, because it was a an Italian man who took his kitchen clock and his kitchen clock happened to be in the shape of a tomato and tomato in Italian is Pomodoro. And he set it at 20 minutes and he would write for 20 minutes and then he would force himself to take a break for, for five minutes. Um, the author of Fight Club, the great movie, The Fight Club, Chuck Palahniuk, uh, mm. he had a habit of sitting down in his chair and throwing his family's laundry in the laundry machine and committing to sit there and write until that laundry buzzer goes off mm. and then getting up and putting the clothes in the dryer and sitting down to write until the dryer buzzer goes off. Right. So, uh, and it, you know, it's kind of ironic because Chuck Palahniuk who wrote the fight club, which is a fairly <clears throat> like macho man, alpha, yeah, I was doing man. laundry while I wrote it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice little uh, factoid there. So, like, I hear you say this, then, and the keys for these people that are having this difficulty in articulation, they're probably stuck in perfectionism. They're probably also, their they're, they're writing muscles atrophied. And what this really comes down to is patterns and consistencies and routines and finding a strategic way to get them in that spot every single day, just saying whatever they need to say, just to kind of get it out of them. And then maybe they can worry about massaging it later but it's about getting that done. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I love that you said that, Andrew, 100%. So yes, employ some sort of strategy, whether it be the laundry or the Pomodoro method. Or of course, I mean, we all have a stopwatch on our phones, mm -hmm. Andy. Uh, put your stopwatch on, put it, or put it on your phone and then put your phone halfway across the room, launch it, you know, as far away from you so you don't look at it. And until that stopwatch goes off, you know, until that alarm goes off, you sit and commit to writing, not editing, because mm. again, storyteller or, you know, right brain creative versus left brain editing yeah. takes a different part of our brain. Spit it out, edit it later. Yeah. Good mm. writing is rewriting, right? It It's, you're expected to have a shitty yeah. first draft. You're, like, you're preaching is, to the choir. You're preaching yep. to the choir. So yeah. yeah so this well, is as you know, you've gone through the experience, right? So yeah. You know, when people ask me like, you know, did you, how, you know, how long did it take you to write your book? I'm like, well, I kind of edited it. You know, that's, I really, for me, my experience was like spitting out just ideas on the page and then massaging it in a way that it was clear and easy to process for the reader. That was my whole yeah. mindset around it. So really <laughs> cool to hear your, your, your confirmation on, on how good of an idea and how important this is. And I imagine that, you know, a lot of this comes down to, again, just being smart with who, like who you are, what your schedule is, like whatever you need to do and the understanding that it gets easier, but it's like by engaging in that process and engaging in that habit, you're creating the connections in your neurons and your brain so that it gets, gets easier and easier to do each time. So that's like any other muscle that you grow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you brought up the analogy and, you know, growing the muscle, it is is exactly it's thickening the cortex um, of that, you know, of that part of the brain strengthening that muscle. Mm. And it is literally like going to the gym and getting a personal trainer, they will kick your butt the first time and you feel like you cannot walk, you'll try to get up from the toilet and you won't be able to. And somehow you drag your butt to the gym two days later. Uh, and by, you know, three days later, you do not want to go back, but somehow you do. And yeah. so on and so forth. And if you quit at the beginning, uh, then you'll never see the rewards of yeah. that muscle having grown. You're, you're costing yourself the opportunity to program resiliency into whatever it is you're looking to improve. A hundred percent.
Nice. 100%. So um, again, me knowing what you do and what your company does, obviously want to cover this part of the creative process. Like let's address something for people. Now there's the other end of the spectrum. There's the marketing. There's that yeah. piece. Like what are people missing about the marketing of their message or their product or their book, where if they only knew this one thing or these one or two things, it would literally change everything and would literally open up all these new doors for them. You know, that's such a great question, Andrew. And I, I have to say, you are quintessentially probably one of the best examples of a direct marketing, direct promotion, like success story, really. You've done a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal job. And there are also a lot of other authors. It, it, once again, it depends on what your end goal is. So you're as the expert or authority archetype, as I call it. Uh, other people are writing books to get people into a door of an event, for instance. Mm. Uh, so their strat strategy around marketing is going to be very different. Um, they might be not using their book as necessarily the driver of the uh, of their business, but as a uh, sliding into promotion of something else. So it really depends on how you are positioned. Uh, I work with a lot of fiction authors, uh, a lot of... Uh, magical realism authors, uh, authors who are looking primarily to get a movie. And I actually do work with uh, a lot of women, women's empowerment authors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are looking to either leverage their book to create movie deals or to create movements or to create uh, impact in a market, right. as well as authority archetypes looking to create for business. Each one of those has a little bit of a different marketing slant, though the greatest thing to do is actually learn what one niche is doing for marketing and employ that in another niche because you'll be the outlier. You'll be the one not doing that. Mm, I like that. That's yeah. great. And, you know, can you, even reading between the lines, I mean, you're talking about a lot of these books, the purpose of the book for these people is to sell their event, to sell their retreat, in addition to movies. They have events, they have retreats, they have... Um, higher touch point experiences that that's the real end game. And for them, the book is just about getting them in the door, meaning the ways by which they will market that it's all in the context of this. It's almost like, you know, the author of XYZ is holding a retreat. It's like, okay, they are just throwing the book into the title as the positioning point right there. Exactly. So, I, I, so exactly. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. Exactly. As you're saying, uh, some authors may choose to price their book at a lower price point, for instance, two ninety nine, ninety nine dollars cents, let's say during launch week, just to get it into the Amazon um, ranking, uh, the ADSR. Mm. Uh, other authors will position their book as let's say a $19.99 or $20 price mark, uh, because they want a little bit more of an exclusivity or a lucrativity to that book. So it's two different approaches. The one who's priced it at the higher end of the uh, price bracket, when they're charging a, let's say, a, a two to $500 event for a, for a workshop, and they're gifting that book, then the client feels like a raving, they're building a raving fan culture because they feel more like a VIP. Because mm -hmm. it's not just a two ninety nine or 99 cent priced ebook uh, that that they're receiving, they're receiving something of higher value. Two different approaches, neither one is, one is not more right than the other. And I know I just uh, took the liberty of, you know, creating grammar that, does, that isn't English, but it's, I, I'm an author, I can it do that. It still makes sense, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> one isn't more right, quote unquote, than the other. Mm. Uh, one isn't better, one isn't, you know, one is not lesser or, or better. It's just different approaches, depends what you want to do as your end goal. Uh, imagine if uh, you are attending a movie premiere and uh, you have VIP access and, and exclusivity and you are given a first edition copy of that book. How much would you prize that? Hmm. Right. It's about status, authority, positioning, all those pieces. So so really to kind of skip ahead here, like a, a, a marketing mistake that people tend to make is from what I'm, what I gather from you is they don't understand, or they don't at least have in mind the true purpose of their book as they're trying to put it out there. 100%. They don't, you know, they haven't answered the question of like, okay, well, this is a vehicle for the event. Am I honoring that and being strategic? If this is just about book sales, am I honoring that? 
It's if this is about getting on a bestseller list for status. Is this is about getting on a bestseller list so that I can get on more bestseller lists. Like what is what is the thing I'm trying to go for? And can I use that knowledge, that understanding to inform how I'm going to go about marketing and putting it out there? 100%, 100%. And each one of them has different objectives, different results. Like we're looking for different results. Uh, if it is, for instance, an authority archetype that's looking to get their name out there, grow their list, support their podcast, support their uh, video uh podcasts, video, you know, vlog podcasts. What do they call them now? I mean, video podcasts, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still called them podcasts because they just, <laughs> like you were talking about, like the book means one thing. The meaning of a podcast is also transcended and pushed past the boundaries of audio. I agree. I agree. Especially what we're, what we're seeing now in the wake of, you know, everything mm -hmm. being consumed digitally uh, and people looking to, to create relationships uh, in video. But um, for someone who is looking to create a mark in the marketplace, uh, for instance, in an, as an authority archetype, as you are, which I'm assuming most of your listeners and watchers, viewers, are you know following the same in the same niche, then yes, getting mass di distribution, digital distribution, but getting as many books in front of as many eyes as possible by creating a price. Uh, a you know a accessible price point by creating a few variants of price points for different launches relaunching maybe every quarter or every you know every few months uh, in order to drop the price to get more eyes on it this is a very different strategy hmm. um, than someone else might might employ and also there are lots of authors uh, who break all the bounds of all of this. There are authors who drive at a higher price point and somehow get, you know, picked up virally. Mm -hmm. There are lots of authors who go on to huge lucrative success by a very low priced ticket point. Um, you know, sometimes they even have a, a VIP culture, a Raven van, fan VIP culture built by doing the free plus shipping model. Right. Usually, though, that's to back up another business. Got it. Because long term success, it would actually be. Um, I mean, and this is I'm geeking out about this, but like if if you look at, let's say, Brendan Bouchard or. Uh, Russell Brunson or something like that, they do the free plus shipping model. Mm -hmm. It's not about the book for them. Yeah. I mean, Russell Brunson, his credit is brilliant. You know what I love about Russell Brunson's books? Like sometimes you'll get um, marketing books. They're giving you like half, the like they're giving you part of the, they're giving you a little of the sizzle, but not the steak. And you've got to like buy the hiring program for the steak. Right. Now Russell's got hiring stuff, but he gives you so much in that book because he wants you to be a marketing expert because he knows He's selling you on the software that you use for it. So the beauty of Russell Brunson is he's giving you everything to win and succeed because his end game is, is a higher level. That's why I love reading his books because you know he's not going to shortchange you. He's going to give you what you need to succeed. Perfect. So there you go. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You're, you're seeing he is giving value add price point of very little. But if, if the end of his funnel the end of his business were a book, he'd be losing money hand over foot, hand over, you know, time and time again, because yeah. he can't, I can't sustain that. But you've bought a book, you are now a raving fan of his. And so you will invest your resources, your time, your energy, your money in his later programs because of what he did in the book. Yeah. Great strategy. And more importantly for him, his, his software as a service, you know, that's, you know, click funnels. Yeah. Whether, so, you know, whether you like it or not, <laughs> he gets you there. So, <laughs> I, I mean, and, and we just picked up on that one because it's one of the most recognized ones, but there are others who are doing the, you know, who are following that exact same model. Again, yeah. though, strategy. Uh, we can talk about Brendan Bouchard in the same way. Uh, you know, free plus shipping offer, but he gets you, because he's giving so much value add, he's, yeah. he's buying raving fan culture. They're going, looking, going, Wow. This right. guy's giving me all of this and I get a physical book in the mail and I get to, you know, put it on my book stand. 
oh, and I get a percentage off for his event. Gosh, I right. like him so much from what he writes. I'm, I don't think that any of his fans would say gosh, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. I love where this conversation is going. And, and you can probably tell I've been very intentional knowing what you do, knowing what your company does. I definitely wanted to dip into the you know, little tips for writing part. And I obviously want to dip into the marketing and we even snuck in a little extra strategy there. And we are almost out of time, but I didn't want to waste this opportunity before we get there, knowing what you know and with how you serve people and how your company serves people. If there's one, is there one piece of advice that you just wish to convey for people where if they hear it, it will get them in a much higher position of power that they can move forward in this kind of process? A hundred percent. I mean, I really fully like, fiercely believe uh, that the game has changed. I am committed to every single person having a book. Mm. The game has changed and it's, it, we're not diluting the waters. I mean, it is like, uh, you know, there was a time when I was a teenager that, you know, if you had a cell phone, uh, you were probably the drug dealer at the, you know, at the school. Like that's, that's the culture that I, right? It was like, who has a cell phone? Hmm. You know, you looked at them like the outliers. Today, who doesn't have a phone? Those are the outliers. The same thing with a book. I, every single person should have a book, not just the drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Even the drug dealers should have a book. But, I'm sure um, he can teach a lot about sales, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. And, and, Get him and, hope uh, and you're good. raving fan culture. <laughs> but, uh, and it begins with a book. Hmm. It literally we have it in our mind. We say, oh, that guy wrote the book on this. Andrew, he wrote the book on law of attraction. In fact, it's the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read. Literally, we, we find synonymous with expert is a person who wrote a book. Hmm. So it begins with a book, not, you know, it, if, if you're, if the intention for your business, for your life, for anything is to create a business, to begin with a book, always begin with a book. Not only does the book give you the clarity of what you want to say and where you want to go and has you committed to it, it gives you such brand awareness, recognition, opens the doors. If I, I wish really, if it's the one thing I could like compel people to understand, I wish people people would get it it's so easy so accessible and it opens up so many doors and not just if you're an expert in the field uh, or an authority the way that we are going what what i know is coming down the pipeline uh there's going to be a huge 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 market for a certain type of book and i, I don't want to let that bag of, that cat out of the bag i want to leave a little mystery Okay. A little well, bit of mystery. Speaking then of curiosity gaps here, M, aka Lady M, <laughs> aka Mara of Richter, if people want to connect with you and learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, please go to maravrichter.com. In fact, if you go to maravrichter.com forward, forward slash 6AA, so that's uh, the, the six author archetypes, you'll be able to take a little self-assessment and find out which author archetype you are. And we can proceed from there because once you know what you are, you can know what, how to proceed, where to go. Awesome. I love it. Well, then that case, final question for you. If you can go back in time, 10, 15, yeah. 20 years, whatever, and give any kind of advice to a younger version of yourself, that younger Lady M, what would that advice be? Oh, get out of your own head. Just get out of your own head. Like really play, oh, play, play. Like that would be my biggest advice. This is fun and games. Um, and younger lady M uh, really um, chose to take the hard work way. Um, and there was no need for that. Mm. There was no need for that just a lot of play, just a lot of play. And, 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 you know, and actually even in forgiveness to young lady M who didn't know that yet. Um, it really is also when you're swimming upstream, it feels hard. And, you know, I, when you know better, you do better. 
I didn't know then that I was swim- swimming upstream or trying to paddle my boat upstream and making it hard. Uh, once I realized where I'm in alignment, it's downstream, easy. I'm going with the waters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know better. I'm doing better. Awesome. Great advice. Loving it. And I really appreciate you coming on today, sharing these really awesome insights, giving me kind of like a look. I'd, I don't think I've ever had an interview before where we like, we could talk about the writing, we could talk about the marketing, we could talk about everything in between. So thank you for, for sharing your gifts and, and being there for my audience today. I really appreciate it. My deep, deep, deep pleasure, Andrew. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really an honor. Thank you again, Lady M. That was awesome. Guys, you definitely want to check out MerovRichter.com forward slash 6AA. I will leave that link in the YouTube description of this video if you're watching in video format, or if you're listening to it in audio format, it'll be at ShatteredAmoldPodcast.com where this episode resides. And while I'm giving out links, a quick reminder, you can always feel free to go to LastLawOfAttractionBook.com if you want to check out my book, The Last Law of Attraction Book You'll Ever Need to Read, or you can hit up YouTube.com slash Andrew Cap for the free content devoted to the book. A lot of fun stuff there as well. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you're watching in video, thank you for being a part of this podcast and checking out these guests. And stay tuned. There are more awesome interviews with more awesome people on the way soon. I will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Shatter the Mold at www.shatterthemoldpodcast.com. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan, and it's time to shatter the mold.